All right, we are turning our attention back to last Friday night in Dallas. Katie Taylor obviously getting the win against Amanda Serrano off the judges' scorecards. And naturally, a lot of the talk over the past couple of days has surrounded what happens next for both of these fighters. Uh, MVP promotions are the guys who run the show for Serrano and for Jake Paul. And Akisa Badarian is the co-founder of MVP Promotions and joins us now on the line. Nakisa, how are you doing? Thanks for taking the call. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Owen. So the last couple of days, it's obviously been uh, an interesting experience, I'd imagine, for the Serrano camp. We saw that the blood was up after the fight on Friday night. Since the dust has settled, what has the mood music been like around Amanda Serrano and the camp? Sure. I mean, look, the... The mood is one of pure joy and happiness. The event was a monster of a success. We just got the numbers in the last hour finally confirmed and over 47 million people in the US watched Katie Taylor versus Amanda Serrano too. And over 74 million people globally watched these two women put on a battle for the ages. When we put this event on Paul Tyson, we strategically wanted to make sure that Amanda was a big part of it. And her perfect dance partner to date has been Katie. And we knew by making them the co-main event, we would give women's sport an opportunity that they've not had before. So Taylor Serrano too is now the most viewed women's sporting event in US history. So no matter what the end result was by the judges, Amanda came out a massive winner as did Katie. On that level, in terms of what it has done for their careers, there's absolutely no doubt about it. At the end of the day, I'm sure Amanda Serrano is one of the most competitive women on the planet. So for her to focus solely on that aspect of things, I'm sure is only half the story. So when you speak to her, when you speak to her coach, when you speak to her team, are they still a little bit pissed off about what happened on the judges' scorecards? Yeah, I think, look, I think they obviously believe they won. I believe they won. If you look at the the CompuBox stats, Amanda significantly outpunched Katie Taylor and at a higher accuracy rate. In fact, Amanda set the record for the most punches landed in female boxing history. But put that aside, you could say to the to the eye of the judges or to the eye of the consumer, the fan, the fight was pretty close. What wasn't close was Katie Taylor using her head to lead into the exchanges. And it did result in one point being deducted, but you could easily make an argument that Amanda could have won that fight easily because she way, way outboxed from a punch that perspective, Katie Taylor in that matchup. But end of the day, it's the decision of the judges, what the outcome is. And we have to live with that. And, uh, you know, there is there is a review happening with the commission and MVP around around the headbutting, but it's it's not an intention to kind of take away from what Katie achieved. We're very proud of what Katie and Amanda achieved together. What what is the review hoping to find out? Just just seeing if there there's a case for a no contest in this bout, given the amount of headbutts that occurred throughout the evening, whether they were intentional or, or not. Right. So in Katie Taylor's own words, it was completely accidental. Do you reject her version of events? I, I think, look, I think if you if you watch that fight at the end of the first round, Katie got caught pretty bad, right? And if you go and look, listen to the uh, audio uh, of the corner men in her corner, they immediately asked her to change strategy and to kind of take a different tact in the fight. And she deployed that strategy brilliantly. They didn't you know, tell her to headbutt. No, that's what I did not. They did not. Absolutely not. But my point is, she adjusted her strategy and and she, you know, she deployed it well. So uh, I think if you look at the if you look at the tape, there's plenty of times where Katie is leading with her head. Not saying that's legal or or not legal. The commission ultimately has to determine that. But it's it's pretty uh, pretty repetitive throughout the evening. Is that not just what happens when a southpaw goes up against an orthodox stance fighter? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Amanda Serrano's fought a lot of uh, orthodox fighters and that hasn't been the case. She's only been cut twice in her career, both times against Katie. One thing that I will say is certainly true is that when the cut does come up, you've got to say Katie Taylor did a pretty good job on going after 
that cut. I don't believe that it was <laughs> accidental. What's, or I don't believe it was, sorry, I do believe it was accidental 100%. And I think we're probably going to have to agree to disagree on that particular point, Nakisa. But uh, one thing that's inarguable is that when the opportunity of the cut was presented, she knew what to do in that situation. I, I think I, I am not for one second saying that Katie Taylor purposely cut Amanda Serrano. What I am saying is that Katie Taylor deployed a strategy where she led with her head that resulted in the cut, right? That's Those are two different things. I want to be, be clear on that. And I will say, yes, I agree with you that she very much so did target the cut once it was visible that there was a, a quite gnarly gash on Amanda's eye. Uh, did you go back and listen to the commentary afterwards? Because this has certainly come up for discussion as well over the past couple of days. Nakis at the likes of Rosie Perez, also from Brooklyn, was on commentary. You had uh, a broadcast that a lot of people really believed was heavily biased in Serrano's favour. To, to use the quote of somebody who knows a lot more about it than I do, Shakur Stevenson said the commentators were brainwashing the audience. Shakur Stevenson, who signed to match from boxing, was one of the few people who actually came out and said he thought Katie Taylor won. The overwhelming sentiment online by anyone who knows boxing, by anyone who's a fan of boxing, by anyone who was in the stadium that night, felt that Amanda Serrano won. Having said all that, I have yet to say, you know, I think it was a, a robbery of Amanda Serrano. I think it was a close fight. Again, these two are two of the best athletes in the world and they're made for each other. I do believe if you look at the stats and you look at the point deduction, it could have easily gone and should have gone ultimately to Amanda, but there was no robbery as many people are saying. There was no clear cut. This person definitely won. It was a phenomenal uh, match between two tremendous athletes. Have you started to think what happens next, Nakisa? Because there comes with the whole dynamic here of where a fight happens and with the location of a fight, it kind of comes with the power aspect of all of this. Like it felt like a very MVP uh, event on Friday night, which it was an MVP event. Is Amanda <laughs> Serrano uh, content with the possibility of doing, say, a matchroom event, a different promotion, if, they, if you guys are going to look for the trilogy? What are you thinking about when it comes to the next step here? Matchroom boxing is irrelevant. MVP is irrelevant. This is about Amanda Serrano and Katie Taylor and maximizing the opportunity for the athlete. Too often promoters are more focused about their own brand and their own face and their own opportunity versus what's best for the athlete. Amanda and Katie will fight again at some point, I'm sure. And, you know, the, the big winner that night was both Amanda and Katie because now there's no trilogy in the contract. Had Amanda won, there was a pre-negotiated deal with pre-negotiated terms for the trilogy. But guess what? More people saw Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano fight than any fight in history, male or female, since the days of Muhammad Ali, other than Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson, right? So Taylor and Serrano just had the biggest fight in history other than Paul and Tyson. So the price of what they are together just went up meaningfully. So it's, it's a great outcome that actually Katie Taylor won. And of course, it means that everybody should get into a room and try and make sure that the trilogy happens, right? Yeah, look, from, from my perspective, and in speaking with Amanda and Jordan and Jake, we're all about breaking barriers, making history, doing things that are not boxing. Boxing is a small ecosystem. Our, our goal is to grow that ecosystem. We broke every single record you could think of last Friday. And so we're thinking of ways of how do we elevate the next match for Amanda Serrano, whether that's with Katie Taylor, whether it's with Chantel Cameron, whether it's with Alicia Baumgartner, whether it's with you know any of the real greats in the sport, uh, that's what we're focused on. But of course, there's a desire for, for Amanda and Katie to fight again. My hope is it will be a 12 round, three minute event, which to be honest, in many ways favors Katie Taylor, given she is the more fundamentally experienced boxer with her amateur career but really putting these two women on a, on a stage that's equal to the men. Do you think that it needs that to be on an equal footing with the men? Like it, this gets brought up in a whole pile of sports. And I mean, Serena Williams isn't seen as inferior to her male counterparts because they play one set fewer in the Grand Slams. 
So Serena Williams is a great example. Uh, outside of Serena Williams, the only athlete in history who was a female and was the biggest star of their sport is who Owen? Who do you think? I, Professional sport. Who would you think? The biggest person who is a female and also the biggest star in their sport. Yeah. Oof, you're putting me on the you're putting me on the spot here. I mean, uh, is like you tell me, is Caitlin Clark about to become the the most relevant basketball player Not in the United close. States? Not even close, right? Uh, there's only one athlete other than Serena who held that mantle. Ronda Rousey was the biggest star in the UFC for a period of time. What about Simone and Biles? She's not a professional athlete. She's an amateur. All right. Okay. Professional, professional sports. So when I look at that and when I look at what we did at UFC where I was chief strategy officer and chief financial officer, we treated the women 100% equal to the men in every respect from the rules to the pay, to the promotion, to the advertising, to the opportunity. And I want the same for women's boxing. You don't have to choose to do it, but if you want to do it, you should absolutely have the right to be treated exactly as the men are. And that's what's important for Jake and I, that's what's important for Amanda. When it comes to where it will happen, is there a possibility that there may be a rematch that takes place in Ireland? I think the only only way it happens in Ireland is if it's in Croke Park. I think if you heard Jake's interview with Mike Tyson, he made it clear that if you know that's where Amanda wanted to go, he would look to enlist the help of President Donald Trump to make it happen, given that to date Eddie Hearn and Matchroom have been unable to find a way to make the fight happen. And a large reason why they've been unable to make that fight happen is because of the security costs that are needed to run Croke Park for a fight like this. And Eddie Hearn has been unwilling to come up with that cash. However, Eddie Hearn's obviously struck up a pretty decent relationship with the Saudis in the past couple of years. If it were an Eddie Hearn run event uh, propped up by Saudi cash, would that be something you guys are interested in? We, we've shown that we don't really have a limitation in being able to execute massive events. We just put on the biggest event in boxing history, effectively, if you look at the entire marketing campaign and the execution of the event. Um, so this isn't about Eddie Hearn or Saudi Arabia putting up the capital for it. If Amanda Serrano is willing to go to Croke Park, we will do everything in our power to, to make that happen if that's what Amanda wants. Amanda is in the driver's seat here. Amanda is the bigger star here. Every metric you can look at online, every metric you can look at from an interest perspective, every metric you can look at from a sentiment perspective, Amanda Serrano is the face of women's boxing, and we're going to act accordingly as such. When you mean sentiment perspective, what does that mean? Online sentiment. Who, who, who are fans more positive towards? Who do people think won? Who had the bigger audience growth day over day on their social media accounts? Every single metric that you look at, it's all about Amanda. Amanda Serrano is now the most follow, followed female boxer in history. It was Leila Ali until this past weekend. And when it comes to like audience sentiment, I get the thing about followers and all that, but is there an actual metric or a data point for sentiment? Like that the says that she's got Amanda greater sentiment than Katie Taylor. One of 47 million people in the US and she is the biggest star of boxing, yes. And by the way, Jake Paul, who is the biggest face of boxing as a whole, is driven by social media because that's audience. Those are people who are engaged with you on a day in, day out basis. No doubt both Amanda and Katie have phenomenal fan bases in Ireland and Puerto Rico respectively. But those are two small populations, right? What, what really is the body of viewership is the U.S. and mainland U.K. And as you know, the U.S. is significantly larger than the U.K. Yeah, can't uh, disagree with that. Uh, on Eddie Hearn, I know you've said it's not about him uh, to a couple of my questions here. What did you guys say to each other in the ring the other night? I think, look, Eddie, uh, Eddie was very happy that Katie won and and I, I would say over the top in his celebration. And, you know, we just had a discussion on his celebration. He was man enough to apologize and, and say he shouldn't have acted the way that he did. And uh, I explained to him, uh, you know, anything that was said during the fight, similar to what he was doing, the judges were sitting there 
uh, you know, it was just verbally trying to express our opinions, but it, you know, it, it just didn't seem appropriate for someone to go into a ring and celebrate the way that he did uh, as, as established and successful and as much of a statement as he is for the sport of boxing. And it was two women making, you know, a, a massive moment for the sport and all eyes were on us. Yeah, it is about the two fighters, I guess. Uh, I mean, we don't really know Eddie Hearn at all, and there's absolutely no need for me to stick up for him whatsoever. Uh, if he were here, he might make the case that there's no need for Jordan Maldonado, a coach, to be buttoning in on an interview and saying that uh, the headbutting of the opponent was illegal or even for a fighter to question how dodgy or otherwise the judges might might have been on their scorecards. Well, those are the fighters and, and their trainers, right? No different than uh, the post-fight presser. There was a lot of a lot of discussion around they didn't want to le- put Eddie Hearn in the press conference. The way that MVP looks at it, you know, I, I, I joined Jake Paul for the press conferences because him and I own the company 50-50, and he's there both as an owner, as a fighter. But outside of that, it's always our fighters who we have speak because we want the media to hear from our fighters. We want the exposure to be on our fighters. So if you look at that post-fight presser, Katie didn't say much. It was it was more Eddie speaking, which is great. Eddie's a great speaker, and as I said, he's he's a recognized figure in the sport. But do that separately. Let Katie have her time. Let her have her moment. Go to this. Go to the matchroom social media handles. See what you see post fight. What did they post post fight about Katie Taylor? Owen, have you seen it? I haven't seen it. That's what they posted. You're going to tell me they posted Eddie Hearn. Otherwise, no, they posted zero. Oh, zero. They posted zero about Katie Taylor. They posted Sky Nicholson. Right. Uh, why? So that was it. That was the reason why Eddie Hearn was, uh, quote unquote, uh, barred from approaching the top table on Friday night was just purely to do with spotlight on Taylor is what you guys wanted. If you look at any of our fighters, they go in there by themselves. If you look at any of our events outside of me and Jake sitting together, right, co-owners, the fighters go up there themselves. That's how that's how we do it. And he was about to do it a different way, and he was told to stop going up there. Basically, I think our PR team said uh, they only want the the fighter and the trainer. Right. Um, can I ask you about the Coleman event? Oh, in... Don't miss my point that I just said. Right. Look at Katie Taylor just won the biggest fight of her life in front of the biggest audience in women's sports history in the U.S. In history, across all sports, there's no there's no recognition of her. Ah, there's loads, there's, there's, there's loads of recognition all around the world. I mean, the fight was absolutely amazing. By match. I'm, I'm sure privately they're uh, they're pretty stoked that they, they, they have... Nicholson and not Katie Taylor? I, I don't know. That's a, a question for them, I guess. But I'm sure they're pretty delighted that they've got Katie Taylor in their stable. And they're looking yes. forward to potentially organizing the next fight in, along with their friends' MVP promotions. Um, <laughs> the Tyson fight, the Jake Paul fight, was it... Better than you expected? Was it worse than you expected? I think, look, when we made that fight, we didn't know what to expect, right? And the reason it was such an interesting matchup and the odds reflected that, odds much closer than any fight you've seen at the, at the you know, heavyweight levels, at the Canelo level, at the Gervonta Davis level, the odds were close from day one because it was hard to predict what it was going to be. Does Mike Tyson have one one punch knockout power? Yes. I can make you a video of 400 different pundits that and experts that talk about Mike Tyson's going to knock out Jake Paul, including people who are current fighters, ex-fighters, et cetera. Was there a possibility that Mike was not going to be able to keep up with the youth and the stamina of Jake? Absolutely. And I think, you know, ultimately that's why Jake and I were focused on putting that fight on Netflix and making it free to those who actually subscribe to Netflix which before this fight was 282 million people post this fight a lot more. Um, And I think very impressive performance by both men for Mike Tyson at that age to come back in better shape than he was when he retired to go in there against a young, strong guy. And for Jake Paul, four years into his career, four years into his career with 12 fights, no amateur experience to go composed with full self-confidence in front of 72,000 people face off against the baddest man on the planet. I'm, I'm beyond impressed by both guys. Mike Tyson's performance is very impressive. Is, sorry, that's a question. Did you, I'm just clarifying that you thought he was very impressive on Friday night. 
I thought for what he did, it was extremely impressive. The movement, particularly in the first few rounds, his peekaboo style at that age to continue to be able to be elusive was very impressive, absolutely. But he only threw 97 punches. Correct, two-minute rounds. Yeah, is uh, you, so that's uh, above or around what you thought he, he would throw because certainly the uh, reviews ha have been, I guess, I think a lot of people actually were, were quite surprised by how ineffective he was and even there was a, a sense, a sense of Jake Paul even being a little bit guilty about, you know, not wanting to knock him out or to not finish the job against him, which doesn't really speak volumes of a great sporting contest. Uh, I think it, it speaks volumes to a great sportsman that he lost uh, that killer instinct when he saw Mike starting to slow down. And Jake Paul has done more for the sport of boxing four years in than any four-year in professional boxer or MMA athlete that you can mention. He's given back more to this sport across many different facets than any MMA fighter or boxer that you can mention. So I think Jake Paul did tremendously well, and I absolutely think Mike Tyson did tremendously well. I, more yeah. in the world watched boxing on that night, and if you combine the last five years of viewership in boxing in total, boxing was a massive winner. We had tremendous fights on that card. We had a tremendous environment, and boxing is at the forefront of global conversation, at the levels of EPL, at the levels of the NFL. doesn't happen. doesn't exist. MVP did that, Jake Paul did that, Amanda Serrano did that, Mike Tyson did that, and Katie Taylor did that. It feels that the card was certainly really good for boxing entertainment and for um, the figures going to record-breaking levels. And no doubt that Taylor Serrano had a part to play in that. But do you not think that Tyson Paul just wasn't very good for the sport of boxing, the sport only? Forget the entertainment and the business side of things for a moment. Do you not think it damages the, the sport a little bit? Ah, oh. he's nearly 60. How did it damage the sport? Because you have this guy who is, uh, as I say, nearly 60, who is entering into a ring where the whole objective is to get your head pucked off you, to knock the guy out. And at the end of the day, the very objective of the sport was shelved because Jake Paul felt a little bit guilty about going up against a guy who was How pretty was it just tell me how it was. How did it take away from the sport? How did it reduce interest in the sport? How did it take away from getting young people interested in becoming boxers? When I walked into my son's school today, almost every single kid had watched the the, the event. How is that bad for the sport, Owen? What? Explain that. Are they, are they more interested? Who paid, attention, who paid attention to the Latino night that happened the next day? Uh, for boxing? How many kids were inspired to pursue this sport? How many new viewers did it drive? Wait, are you saying that those kids are more interested in lacing up a pair of gloves because they watched Paul versus Tyson? Absolutely, they're all more interested in boxing. They watched they the entire more interested event? in lacing up a pair of gloves and participating in the sport after watching that? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. What do you think they're going to be more interested in? A highly technical bout between two individuals they've never heard of that, that don't bring any passion and excitement to it? I mean, I, I don't know what frame you're looking at it from, but it was a tremendous night for the sport of boxing. I'm, I'm, no looking, at, I'm looking at it through the frame. No one can deny that. If you're looking at it from a purist perspective of, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to be from a boxing perspective of two great athletes, that's th that you're thinking about it the wrong way. I'm, boxing has become a smaller and smaller sport. Oh, with for sure. That is creepy. Oh, for right? sure. I don't. I don't disagree with that last point, but I'm. I'm. I'm looking at this through the frame that you presented. Do, is is this is this fight to going to inspire the next generation to box? Absolutely, it is. Right. As okay. Jake has said, as Jake has said, some kid and many kids watched it. The stat to to tell you the stat: fifty six percent of homes in the U S. that night during the Paul Tyson fight were watching Paul Tyson. Yeah. So out of every every two homes in the U S., one of them was watching this event. And there's a lot of kids who watched the event and learned about boxing for the first time. And That's it, powerful. And it got booed in the arena. No, it, 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 got, it got booed at some point, yes, one round. Very common in boxing. I don't disagree that Jake Paul has done positive things for boxing. Uh, my point is about this headline fight. Uh, himself and Mike that Tyson. That grew interest in the sport of boxing. Yeah, Owen. and listen, I think in terms of like what uh, Serrano earned what Katie Taylor earned. It was, in isolation, a phenomenal night for women in the sport. 
Uh, one of my wasn't it in isolation? Shadeja Green had nine hundred thousand people watching her on a YouTube stream during this fight. That's not isolation. She became a champion for the first time. I don't know if you paid attention to the full card and the full offering, but there was something there for everybody to consume on a global basis. And many boxers got a tremendous opportunity and got eyeballs on them like never before. Never before. Look at the metrics. Anthony Joshua fought uh, Daniel Dubois in the UK in front of 70,000, 80,000, 90,000 people. Look at the interest level of that fight globally. Even in the UK, we blew that out of the water in the UK. Not even close. Not even close. And every fighter on the card got those eyeballs, not just Paul Tyson. Yeah. So, you know, to say anything other than it was a tremendous moment to grow this sport is misguided. It's just, it's a snobby boxing view of the world in a sport that's now being less and less covered in the U.S. by big media. We brought big media back to the table. While we're on this call, there's a press release going out saying 125 million people watch this fight. I don't doubt that. Tell me, tell me what other tell me what other sport sporting event that you know of achieves those numbers at the professional level. Yeah, it's I'll tell you the, the numbers are phenomenal. The numbers there's are only phenomenal. One, the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. <laughs> so we brought the Super Bowl to boxing. Yeah, that's a huge win. Oh, listen, from a business perspective, I, I do not doubt the, the, the impact of, uh, and the, of it being a good business thing. In front thing. of people's eyes, just like Muhammad Ali used to do. Muhammad Ali had the entire world watching the sport. He yeah. was the most popular athlete uh, in the world. Muhammad Ali, about boxing. Muhammad Ali was in the ring a number of years after he should have been in the ring as well, Nikisa, and I don't think that was necessarily a good thing for Muhammad Ali. So uh, when it comes to c comparing legendary boxers who are boxing well beyond their 30s, um, I'm not sure. I'm like talking I... about the power of the sport. Yeah, we're doing sure. an interview about boxing first and foremost. What, one last thing it is: Do you think? Well, like one of my concerns about this, and like you can call it uh, snobbery if you want, and you're you're completely welcome to have that view of this. Uh, but it was just like a, a line from one of my colleagues um, in Irish sports journalism, Gavin Casey, who writes for the 42. He said that the point he made the point basically that Taylor versus Serrano, if it's going to be a trilogy needs to be latched onto something like Mr. Beast versus Larry Holmes. Like that this is the sort of thing that is now being, that, is, that it is attached to. Does it need to be attached to this thing that transcends sport that Euro. is a, a lot worse Euro. than sport, that isn't really sport to, to, to a large degree? I think, I think your colleague missed, missed, missed the point here. 74 million people saw Amanda and Katie and they put on the performance of a lifetime. They will 100% carry their own event if they fight again. 100%. Right. Like there's no there's no doubt about it. The entire strategy was to give them more. The first fight, the first fight. Right. We released the numbers, matchroom and MVP with the zone. You remember how many viewers it had? Not to top of my head. One point five million. How many viewers did this fight have? Seventy four million. Yeah. Okay. They carry their no they're, they're going to carry the next fight. And gut feeling, Nikisa, Croke Park for the trilogy. Got feeling. I mean, like, leave all the the, uh, the the head thinking to one side for a moment. Do you, do you think it will happen one day for this pair? Because they are, you say, you refer to them as the best dance partners out there. Uh, and I'm not going to disagree with you on that point. If, if Amanda and Katie said they wanted to make that happen, I have no doubt Jake would do everything in his power to get the help of President Trump, who Jake has a very close relationship to. And I have no doubt that MVP and its partners will put in the capital required to put on the event. Nikisa, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and congratulations on uh, the success of Friday. It was definitely a, a big one for you guys. Oh, and thank you, man. I appreciate the, the back and forth and the honesty. Cheers. Chat soon. Absolutely.